Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Steffen, this is Daniel, um, and this is joint work with Manuel. So I think many of you may know Daniel. Um, he's been a regular at BotCon for, oh, sorry. Um, many of you may know Daniel. He's been a regular at BotCon for quite some time. Um, it's my first time here, so hi. Um, yeah, and you may already know him or uh, me from some projects such as Malpedia. Okay. So today's topic is a taxonomic overview of uh, prevalent malware communication strategies. So one thing I'd like to start with always is motivation. So why is malware C2 that important? The thing is we're at BotConf, so um, if you heard the same talks as me like the past two days, and even today, um, we should be on the same page that malware C2 is quite important and uh, many people talked about it. Networking is um, even in the name. So let's don't waste too much time here and uh, go to the more interesting motivational question. So why do we need a taxonomy? Or one could say a, a new or additional taxonomy. So one thing that I personally noticed like the, the, the past two days is many people were talking about Mara C2. I think like every second talk mentioned it in some way. Um, but one thing that was missing from my researcher point of view is like a, like, yeah, the taxonomy, taxonomy basically, because um, in order to more effectively talk about it, it really helps if you know which categories are interesting and um, like, yeah, you discuss each of those and not only just different aspects. And this is what effectively happened like the past two days. Um, yeah, so in, let's say you're developing like a new tool or like um, countermeasures, it really helps if you can get this piece of information that you're interested in from all of those talks. And yeah, finally what we noticed is that if you want to get into malware traffic analysis, there, I mean there are great sites like um, malwaretrafficanalysis.net, shout out to Brett. Um, but what's missing here again is like a taxonomic overview, like a data set that you can use to get trained on all of those techniques. So let's say you're starting out, want to analyze technique A, then technique B. Um, it really helps to um, yeah, know which malware family is using technique B and have easy access, access to like um, yeah, a live PCAP and um, in order to get into it. Oh, and finally, that's what the slide is hinting at. You're able to do some great statistics. So those are the families we looked at and um, those are the families that Daniel's going to talk about like in five minutes or so. Okay, so a tox taxonomy for Mary C2 strategies. As I said, there are quite a few, not too many, but a few. Um, the thing about them is that most of them are for botnets. Um, I know we had botconf, but still not every malware is a botnet. So um, in order to, for them to be generally applicable, you don't want too many botnet specific stuff in there. So um, yeah. And basically, none of them like um, is generally applicable. MITRE attack has also been around, but um, although it contains many, if if not even most of the aspects that we'd like to cover, um, it's it's not specific enough for um, Mary C2. Yeah. So what's the most natural thing to do as a researcher? <laughs> yeah, um, create a new one. So that's what we did. Created a new malware, a new taxonomy. Um, which looks like this. So we have six categories. We have a C2 models, we have rally mechanisms, we have the communication behavior, we have the carrier communication protocols, C2 protocols, and evasion techniques. Um, so this whole thing is based on the trend micro report, but we made a few changes. So first of all, the communication behavior is added. Then we properly differentiated the um, carrier communication protocols and the C2 protocols. Um, and then finally we removed like all um, botnet specific stuff. And removing this isn't a bad thing because if you want to put it in there, you can cover it with um, the other categories as well. So let's get through each of those sections and um, see what we like um, to cover with it. Even closer, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's start with the C2 models. So basically C2 models are the high level classification um, of the structure of the overlay network. 
So um, yeah, if you're thinking takedowns, if you're dealing with instances of infected machines, it's um, really helpful to know the high-level network structure. Um, so for instance, if dealing with a P2P network, you may be dealing with bots and not servers. Um, yeah, so on the top right, you can see the categories we are differentiating, um, which are basically centralized peer-to-peer, -peer, hybrid, and random. Yes, I know random, but um, <laughs> because um, random is also included in other taxonomies, we decided to, to keep it and um, also include it. Then we have um, rally mechanisms, which is like the category we um, saw the most of the, the past days, I think. Um, so for rally mechanisms, we, mo we are mostly interested in how the initial communication channel is established. And that's can, this can either be to hard-coded IPs, domains, um, also can be DGAs. Daniel told me there's at least one around still. Um, and also um, things like interactions via web services, etc. And I think the main reason for also why we saw them like that much the past two days is because this is really interesting if you're thinking blocking um, and that more it may also like expose hints towards um, adversary infrastructure. Then the communication behavior, as I said, um, was missing uh, in the Trend Micro report. However, from our point of view, it's also very interesting as a characterization of how the communication is, is happening and thus needs to be in the um, taxonomy. So for this, we mainly differentiate in two categories. First of all, the transformation can be push or pull, and the sessions can be one or two way. So uni or bidirectional. Um, yeah, and again, if you like want to communicate with instances of the botnet, it's really important to know how this communication behavior is implemented. Um, so yeah, this is the third category. Next one is like the most interesting one. Um, in terms of the new taxonomy, I think, because previously the um, communication protocol wasn't like differentiated between carrier communication protocol and the actual protocol that is used to transmit data. So for this, um, the first category is like carrier communication protocols. We want to know which protocol is used to transmit the customized data, which then again can use a different protocol. And um, yeah, this can either be like some, some raw TCP UDP sockets, can be raw TLS. Um, oftentimes, we're going to see some application layer protocols such as HTTP or HTTPS. Um, and well, as you can see on the slide, and as we also heard yesterday, it can use some, some uh, web services as a carrier communication protocol such as Telegram. Yeah, and then the actual protocol, I call it actual protocol, the taxonomy calls it C2 protocol, um, is used to actually transmit the data. So um, this is oftentimes very, very specific, so we don't categorize it any further, but mostly you're gonna see something like custom text format, custom binary format. Um, rarely it's gonna be some existing format, um, some existing protocol, but um, yeah. And this is really important, and this is also something we saw the past few days, because um, the knowledge about how this protocol is working is really important to actually extract information and to, do f to have fun with um, communicating with, for instance, a botnet. So if you're thinking milker, crawler, so if you're trying stuff like this, um, it's really helpful and um, necessary to know how the protocol is working. Yeah, and then finally, I would say everything that has been covered in the previous five categories should fit into evasion techniques. So um, evasion techniques are heavily inspired by MITRE ATT&CK and um, f actually for many of them listed in the um, paper, which is it's, um, also, being, also coming out on the website in a few weeks or so. Um, so additionally to that, um, like the most evasion techniques that are covered are also like have a mapping to MITRE ATT&CK. So most of them are already covered by the attack, so it can be something like backup C2 channels, uh, proxies being used, um, encrypted data, obfuscated data, um, or even things like using a non-standard port for the um, carrier communication protocol. Okay, so that's basically the taxonomy. So to conclude it, we have those six categories with um, various aspects. 
Um, as I said, there's going to be a paper, so um, please see the paper for details. And then more importantly, um, if you have any feedback, if you feel that anything is missing, please let us know, find us after the talk. Um, yeah, because the paper isn't finished yet and we are still able, or we will be able to uh, integrate some feedback. Okay, so now we give over to um, Daniel to talk about the application of the taxonomy and the case study we did. Thank you very much. Yes, so since we now have established basically something like a language that we can use to categorize different traffic protocols, um, I really want to start with a little example to show how this can be used. Um, for this, I want to use the sandbox run, in this case, from triage. This is basically also what we did with all of the data that's data to be presented. This is basically the workflow we did for reviewing. And um, as you might be familiar with, triage is uh, capable for config extraction for a lot of different malware families. In this case, we are now looking at, for example, Aurora Stealer. Uh, what we immediately can see is that there's one hard-coded IP address with a port. If we inspect the network tab for the sandbox run, we can also see that there's bidirectional traffic, so we actually receive something back from a C2 server, which is good news, because that would be something that we can use to, to study this case. Looking deeper at the PCAP, um, one thing that we might notice here is that the communication is initiated by the server, so we are first receiving something before the bot is basically talking back. Um, the commands that are coming from the C2 servers are just plain text. On the way back, we see that's apparently base64. Um, there's a really good blog post by Mohamed Adel um, about how to decrypt this traffic, for example, and we can see that's basically JSON ultimately, which is wrapped, um, first zipped and then wrapped in, in base64. So applying our taxonomy, you would end up with something like, we have a centralized model because we talk to a determined server. For rallying, we know one hard-coded IP address. Communication behavior is two-way because we have communication back and forth and push in a way because the C2 server initiates the communication. Carrier protocol is just TCP, so no HTTP or anything involved. And for the internal protocol, like I just said, we have uh, different takes on uh, server and bot communication. Um, evasion techniques is in some terms probably a bit specific to what you're looking at. Data obfuscation, in this case for the bot communication, um, could also be just data transformation, which you would likely see for, for many of the different cases that we're discussing. Now, um, what we wanted to do with our evaluation was basically to verify that this taxonomy is applicable to many different families. And while doing that, at the same time, provide an overview of how does Mavacy do communication look right, right now. This means basically looking at a wide array of different families and trying to categorize their behave, um, behaviors. Um, in order to identify the currently prevalent malware families, we decided to look at Malware Bazaar. Shout out to Roman and UCH for this great project. And we specifically looked at the last one and a half years uh, going back from February this year. Uh, what we then did is identify the most submitted families and then try to find a live sandbox run for each of those families so we could get an idea about that. Um, a student in our department also wrote a PCAP filtering tool, which was then applied to all of the sandbox runs in order to really uh, narrow down on the actual C2 communication. And the idea is that this data set that has been produced will be published alongside with the paper uh, when it's finally done and everything is integrated. Just to give you an overview, the top 20 families, um, overall we have seen roughly 200,000 submissions to MEVABASAR in this time when we were looking at with um, roughly 85% of families being identified. And uh, the most popular in this time frame were example Redline, but um, with Mirai we see a, a, already another family that's not for Windows, for example, um, so we also didn't want to discriminate by platform and it included at least two um, yeah, ELF or Linux-based MEVA families in that case. Yeah, for many of the other ones, you can see that there are a lot of loaders, stealers, and so on that you are probably very well familiar with. Uh, the top 20 cover already 76% of the submissions to Mavabazaar, and all of families considered um, that we looked at basically add up to 81% something. So there's really a heavy tail for the remaining signatures, but uh, many of them having only few submissions. Yes, so as um, already was shown by Steffen before, this is basically the collection of Mavia families we were looking at. And in order to find live sandbox rumps for them, I think uh, we had a look at more than 22,000. Uh, yeah, 2,200 sandbox runs in order to find one for really for most of those families. So um, for many of them, it was pretty easy. For some, it was so hard that I think I looked at uh, four, 500 form book runs and I was still not able to find one with uh, responsive servers. So it was 
quite a bit of effort. Um, same for Loki. Um, and then you also have the issue that sometimes, or in many times with the loaders, you will have impure sandbox runs where obviously the follow up payload is also found in the PCAP. But um, the loader is initiating communication first, so it can still differ between the two. Okay. With that out of the way, let's have a look at the statistics basically. Um, now we can also basically confirm or correct your own biases because all of you probably have an idea about how C2 at, with many families might look like or um, uh, if the assumptions that you might carry around um, hold up, at least with the cases that we looked at. Um, one important thing is all the data that's now shown basically is only for the one observed run. So we did not basically interpolate across multiple runs for those families. Uh, or basically correlated it with write-ups. Although in the paper we will be listing uh, one to three reference blog posts, analysis reports, and so on that basically go on the C details for the respective C2 protocol used by the family being discussed. Yes, with the first dimension, looking at the C2 model, um, what we can see is basically that all of them are nowadays, or at least the ones that we considered, are using a centralized model, uh, with some of them likely also using hierarchical models, as has been reported. So uh, especially also for the one this, this morning we've seen that they probably have a tiered infrastructure. If you only look at the PCAP, you're mostly not able to see that, so we can just assume centralized in this case. For rallying, um, basically the majority is actually using hard-coded IP addresses, and in combination with hard-coded domains, this adds up to a good um, 80 8% already. So um, almost all the families are basically using hardcore domains and IP addresses. Um, four of them are using SMTP for exfiltration, so we basically would have a mail server with some credentials that were being used to then mail out um, stolen data because of the families listed here, for example, as dealers in this case. Um, two more interesting ones were, for example, DC Red and uh, Vida, who have the capability to, to do indirection. They will, for example, first go to a benign service in order to retrieve their, their real C2 address. In the case of DC Red, they would possibly, for example, go to Pastebin, try to download a little text document where the actual C2 information is contained in. And um, some of you who have been probably a long time at BotConf might know that I gave many years ago a talk about DGAs. Uh, I'm very happy that Bumblebee uh, adopted basically a DGA in 23, so it's still not that. But um, otherwise, we can see that DGAs are rarely used, at least in the families that we are dealing with right now. For communication behavior, there's also not that many surprises. Um, most of them are doing two-way pull. I guess if you are assuming that many of them are do using HTTP as a carrier protocol, that means they will always check in with their server and then possibly return, get a response returned, especially meaning that they have some communication behavior. That means periodic check-ins. On the other hand, if you have a push model, that means the C2 server can control the speed at which um, exchanges are happening. This is way less commonly found, um, which would probably be something that you would find if you would focus more on reds or um, real synchronized communication reds. Um, for those two loaders that are basically using um, benign services, we consider them one-way pull because they have no way to interact with um, a real C2 but are really just tailored to download stuff. And um, SMTP, once again, just means you're pushing out data without any opportunity to receive anything back. For carrier protocols, um, we had a deep look at um, how they are basically hosted. Um, so if you look at reporting, I guess the um, statistics for how many HTTP communications and or generally traffic in the internet being encrypted was something beyond 80% for most of the normal web traffic and so on. Um, I was delighted that this um, was a little bit less in this case. So we had um, around 60% of families that are not using TLS encrypted carrier communication, which means that you at least have a chance to look at um, how they are communicating, which in many cases obviously is still encrypted, but you at least have access in case of somatic protocols to get a uh, visibility op opportunity there. Yes, so um, altogether we see that some of them obviously also going to Cloudflare or other um, traffic distribution systems for um, basically more stability or reliability, and once again our four friends using SMTP there. Um, moving forward, so how are actually the C2 protocols looking like? Um, naturally, if we have a, a TLS encrypted channel, we had no chance to observe this. And as I said, we are basically only focusing on um, what we can observe here. Uh, but we see that um, the around 10 of them, which translates to roughly 20%, are using text-based protocols. 
So in some way, probably uh, divided by delimiters, JSON would also be considered a text-based protocol in that sense, uh, versus binary protocols where you have a fixed format that probably defines fields and has to be passed in another way. Um, for 17 of those families, without uh, doing reversing or uh, consulting other information, you would also have to know, uh, basically assume that they are an unknown protocol because you cannot look beyond whatever uh, custom or unrolled or probably in many cases RC4 encryption they are using for encrypting their traffic. Yes. So altogether, um, this gives already a good idea and overview about how the C2 landscape looks like that we are basically currently dealing with. Um, for the evasion techniques, um, since this is a bit more multidimensional, so we would have to um, list many characteristics as a um, superset essentially for each of the families. Uh, we decided to leave it out of scope for this presentation, also for time reasons, um, and are basically just referring to the paper which will um, discuss this in a bit more detail. Yes. So um, I think what we did here was basically an overview and um, if you have other opinions or observed other details for some of these families, we are very happy about to hear about that. Um, also, if you feel that we left out your new favorite family, um, we can, would also consider to give it a try and try to find more data for them in order to extend it to even be more um, representative as a data set. Um, but ultimately, the idea that we wanted to achieve with this, and this is also basically where I want to come to the conclusion, is um, that this should basically serve as a starting point if you want to um, dive a bit more into traffic analysis. So um, a colleague of ours, for example, uh, had the idea every now and then um, people want to do automatic protocol recovery. And um, getting a starting point for that is really hard because, um, like I said, even identifying um, a wide range of live runs uh, wasn't that easy to be found just on, on one platform, be it for geofencing that is just then applied because they are um, identified and whatnot. Uh, but we, we tried as, as good as possible. And uh, for the families where we were not capable to find them and you have that one run, please link, uh, send a link to me. Yes, so in summary, um, we presented a taxonomy that can be used to um, have a structured look at how um, C2 communication looks like, and we then applied it to a um, data set that we created um, to give an overview of how a C2 looks like, at least in, in families used or pre predominantly used or, um, with respect to Malwarebazaar in the last one and a half years. Yes, and as I said, uh, paper and data set are coming with that. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have questions, please do. Thank you. So we're going to take a couple of questions, just to uh, keep looking at the time. So if you take pictures, you got to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have a good question. Excellent presentation, thank you. When you encounter some families that have multiple options for C2 communication, for example, DNS or HTTPS, um, do you just categorize as, as two separate entities to um, put in the taxonomy? Yes, if you would um, use it as a completely formal model, you could basically say that you have two tuples that define a setting, which would also be applied in, in more traditional families that had like backup channels with DGA, or they would have another fallback, then it would be just to do multiple tuples defining the communication, I guess. They can then naturally overlap in their actual internal C2 protocol, um, but it at least allows to distinguish between those, yeah. Um, you, you've uh, not, not done very much with the ones that say encrypted, but in fact you could probably do a, a taxonomy based on the encryption routines that are used, which, which uh, um, uh, encryption algorithm is used for instance. So, you know, we would know this one does RC4 and that one does AES and, uh, uh, and sometimes it's quite simple. Um, sometimes it's a simple XOR, but it's, uh, um, yeah, we could fit in a lot of gaps in that, in, in that uh, grid of yours, I, I should think. if. Uh, um, the old people in this room put their heads together. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's totally fair. Um, I mean, for those that are generating good entropy and, and streams, it's, it's quite harder because then, um, but I, as I said, basically, we, we only looked at PCAPs this time. So it's, it was no reversing, not looking up reports, and otherwise I would have been able to fill in the gaps. What we will do for the paper, at least, is um, that we 
provide this information in, in brackets so that you get a better idea of what might be actually used for that. Um, but again, that's too detailed to present it here as well because then I have to talk about that family, that family, that family, that family, and I didn't want to do that. Okay. Last question. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, first, to continue on the last question, as a malware analyst, I would also be interested in um, adding a category for encryption uh, specifically, so different types of encryption. For example, is it asymmetric, is it custom? Uh, that's often very interesting when analyzing the traffic uh, to me, so uh, would something like that be possible? And then um, are you also looking at creating similar taxonomies for other parts of uh, malware, for example, host-based artifacts? Um, that's a whole different topic, I guess. Um, I don't know, we consider that as a future research. Um, I can just give you an insight of what we have planned for Mapedia, for example. Um, what we wanted to do there is, for example, that we start categorizing families by their capabilities or something. So it's not really helping with um, host-based artifacts, um, but it will allow tagging, and for tagging you typically need the taxonomy as well. So it might be an opportunity to, to do that in that uh, when we will look at these things. We'll see. Um, yeah, for encryption, um, as I said again, I guess if you have an informed way to fill in this data, which you typically have if you do a deep dive and do more analysis, uh, then you can annotate that way, and we, we can try to consider that for the text only as well. Thank you very much for the feedback. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.